Hi, my name is Paul Douglas Evangay, founder of the Blue Earth Project, and you are listening to the Blue Earth Project podcast, where we inspire a higher quality of life by advocating for ecological resilience in southern Minnesota. We promote honest conversations and awareness of local issues through our social platform. We support businesses, individuals, and projects that are making creative efforts to practice consciously. We engage our community, implement our own programs, and conduct independent research in hopes of finding a solution to some of our most paramount problems. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Blue Earth Project podcast. I'm your host, Paul Douglas Ebengay, and I'm joined by our producer, Dave Sandersfeld, and hey. today's special guest, Seth Yoakum, owner of Aquological Resources. Hi, Seth. Thanks for joining us today. Who are you and what do you do? The work that I do is primarily for education. Uh, I want people to know just what we're missing with the way we treat water. You know, 70% of the planet is water. Mm -hmm. 70% of a human is water, which is always kind of a mm -hmm. fun fact. Yeah. Um, but we, we, we've we relegated water to kind of this secondary or even tertiary role in our lives when it's such a primary role if we uh, don't have it. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, or if you've uh, anyone that's ever been a camper realizes just how important water is <laughs> yeah. when you're way back in, say, the boundary waters or say the mountains or something like that. And yeah. you don't have drinking water or you yeah. don't have clean water. Suddenly it's much more important than it is in the, our day to day lives where we're able to turn a tap. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. I just want to find any different way that I can to integrate water into people's lives. And, and for me, that manifests primarily as aquariums and ponds. Um, but it's gotten more and more into um, something called aquaponics, uh, which is the growing of plants with water and all of that. So there's all these different ways that water is rolling through our lives, you know, in the, our sewers below us, the tap that we have in our kitchens and bathrooms and mm -hmm. things, but we don't have it free flowing through our cities, which is the proper role of, of what water is traditionally done. So uh -huh. education, yeah. awareness, and then just all the, you know, really scary facts that are coming out about what we're doing to water and what we're doing to this planet. And that was my motivation. You know, I, people sit back and they worry about what's going on. And, and I mean, we can sit around and worry. And with the news that comes out more and more every day, uh, you know, the most recent stuff is that our oceans are holding 60% more heat than they thought, than we thought what they were. And, um, there's just so much with water that we're not doing that a person could either sit back and have panic attacks or anxiety, or you can mm -hmm. actually try to do something. And that's my main goal is to just, if I can get you to change the way you see water or Dave to change the way he sees water, yeah. I mean, we can really, we can start to, to reintegrate water and just that water ecology back into our day-to-day -day lives. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it seems like our, our opportunity in growing closer to water is kind of divided into two different sections. On one end of the thing, you have the opportunity in the future of agricultural practices. And then on the other hand, you have uh, multiple opportunities within the city in the more urban setting, you know, within the typical person's home or workplace and, you know, city life and infrastructure that could be changed to adopt some ways to really embrace water is a is a critical and vital component of human life and um you know it sounds like you've got a, a handful of different projects and ideas and implementations that you work with maybe you could go into a little more detail about what some of these solutions are or implementations are yeah yeah well to to get into it i need to really kind of establish a, a basis of of knowledge on what aquaponics is um, and, and to do that, basically, water and plants have this fascinating relationship, and they've been doing it for, you know, millennia. Um, plants will take, uh, they don't actually grow in soil. Every, everyone thinks you plant your plant in soil, and there you go, it's growing in the soil. Plants mm -hmm. actually grow off of the water-soluble nutrients that are in the soil. Okay. The soil is simply what holds the plant in place. Mm -hmm. You know, you can mm -hmm. have dense beautiful black soil and if the right pH isn't there if the white right water chemistry isn't there the plants aren't actually going to flourish so there's this great relationship that plants and water have and we've recently rediscovered uh, with they today we call it aquaponics but they've been using it for centuries actually the the Mexicans used it back in the 1600s um, and the Egyptians used it potentially 2,000 years ago because they recognized the value of, of how we could grow 
plants and clean the water simultaneously. Oh, um, two thousand years ago, cool. <laughs> right? Yeah. So <laughs> while it's a it's a new uh, discovery, it's a rediscovery of old technology. So it's kind of reintegrating some of that stuff that those ancient civilizations had for you know potentially centuries that they were able to kind of maintain. Whereas here we are a hundred years after um, establishing civilization here in kind of the Mankato mm -hmm. area, we've already kind of damaged the way our water ecology is looking. Look at the nitrogen and phosphorus in the lakes and rivers. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, if we can kind of return to some of that old school methodology, perhaps we can integrate growing plants into our wastewater management and have either a viable food production facility or some of the other options would be what other forms of plants can we use to um, have textile manufacturing um, processes or um, you know basically whatever we can use plants for we can do that with aquaponics therefore gaining the benefit of the plants either from decoration or food production and also having a byproduct of clean water I don't see any uh, any way to lose on that situation, really. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it sounds like good stuff. Why Why exactly is aquaponics the best way to go? Is it naturally better, or is it just when we're dealing with uh, excess chemicals, water-soluble chemicals in our waterways, now we have an opportunity to reduce them through aquaponics? But is aquaponics by itself, like if it weren't in the context of that situation, would it still be a better option than growing plants in soil like traditionally most people think is the only way well when I'm consulting on different product projects I I always have to kind of talk to people about so if you know how to grow plants aquaponics will benefit that that relationship that you have it, it will make you a better plant grower if you don't know how to grow plants though aquaponics isn't necessarily going to to be the miracle cure-all you know okay. so um, there's a ton of benefits to it. Uh, there's a, a, it's really relatively easy in the long term, in the short term, but when things kind of go bad, when you start seeing those traditional either deficiencies or um, bug production problems, then you can start to have some real problems if you're not familiar with how to grow plants. Mm -hmm. But all in all, if we've got enough people that know what they're doing, that have that green thumb, so to say, um, we can do a lot with aquaponics. And again, the byproduct is clean water. That, I, there's no way to lose with this. Yeah. We can even, I mean, so we can separate the two. We can, we can have aquaponics that does uh, nutrient mitigation or uh, phytoremediation is the term for mm -hmm. plants growing to remediate the nutrients from the area. Mm -hmm. Now, secondarily, we can focus primarily on a food production, a viable food production, growing fish for the protein. Mm -hmm. And then the carbohydrates come from whatever plant species we're growing. And there is a way um, aquaponically to grow nearly any plant that anyone can think of. So there's there's ways to make this work a across the board. Cool. When I think of aquaponics, I always think of uh, like an indoor, very controlled system. But this is something that's going on naturally in, you know, anywhere with water and, and, and plants, right? So... It, it makes sense that we'd be able to, you know, translate the, this indoor, well-controlled situation into outdoor examples or solutions. For example, reducing uh, excess chemicals in our in our waterways by implementing some sort of aquaponic system, potentially. Right. All we're doing in the indoor, you know, constructive grow where we recreate this closed-loop system is actually mimicking nature. So what we end up with, um, nitrification is the term for what nitrogen does in our environment. And what happens generally is in any body of water, even a glass that you've left sit out on your countertop for 24 hours or so, uh -huh. um, there's actually bacteria free floating like yeasts and things like that in the air. Mm. Um, these bacteria instantly start to collect in the water. And any form of ammonia, any form of waste product in that water, and in city water, um, where we treat with chloramines, you're seeing the ammonia in the form of the chloramines that's already there as soon as it comes out of the tap. So mm -hmm. you have this food product for the nit the nitrifying bacteria to break down. Um, so any body of water starts with ammonia, uh, the nitrifying bacteria turn it into nitrite, then the nitrifying bacteria take it a step further into nitrate, 
Well, so nitrate is the most water soluble form of nitrogen, and it's okay. also the most stable form of nitrogen in water, um, which is why we're seeing all of our lakes and rivers and streams having this buildup mm -hmm. with nitrogen. So mm -hmm. in an aquaponic system where we cultivate the nitrogen and we take care to build the nitrogen in a nutrient mitigation system in a lake or a river or a stream, we're simply taking advantage of the nitrogen that's already there. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like introducing more uh, biomass could be a good thing for reducing uh, things such as nitrates that are in our water in excessive amounts. But well, Let me just interrupt you real yeah, quick. Yeah, I yeah. love that word biomass, and I throw that mm -hmm. word out there so much. Um, the problem is that it's used in, in such a huge range. Um, biomass, they talk about biomass generators and biomass burners for... Um, creating energy, but essentially just to define biomass is simply a mass, the, the volume of a biological entity. Um, when we're talking about it in terms of plants, we're just saying a big plant, you know, the more biomass we can get in a plant, mm. a, you know, something that grows dense and thick and has a, the binding power to bind all this nitrogen and phosphorus in the cellular uh, tissue of the plant. Okay. Hmm. So the bigger plants we can grow, the plants that grow the fastest, obviously, are going to bind the most nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, and then we get into the micronutrients, too. Hmm. Are there any well-known plants that you would suggest? Oh, my God. I mean, there's so there's this great term <laughs> called hyperaccumulators, uh -huh. right? And so um, you can actually Google it. Look on Wikipedia. There's a huge list of hyperaccumulators, and it will give you a list of plants for almost any um, chemical, element, uh, pollutant, whatever you're looking to bind through into the tissue of the plant, there's plants out there that will do this. Wow. Um, actually, in Chernobyl, they started uh -huh. with poplar trees and sunflowers because they've realized that in 40 to 50 generations, they can neutralize some of the radioactivity. Cesium-137, wow. hmm. radon, things of that nature. So, How many people had to die to figure that out? I, none <laughs> that I'm aware of. None that I'm aware just of. Just a couple sunflowers. But I mean, I mean, what we're looking at here is just, it's, it, it's keeping it simple. You know, we're just looking into yeah. nature to see what those analogs are for what we can make machines, essentially. You know, an aquatic machine to clean water and uh, another one to grow food. But they're utilizing these exact mimicries of what nature does every day, all day long. That's awesome. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Part of the big problem is that as humans, we think that we improve things. We think that we jump in there. We're going to make this yeah. more efficient, you know. And what we do is we actually take links out of this chain of what n the way nature processes elements. Yeah. You know, there's the, the carbon cycle, there's the phosphorus cycle, there's the nitrogen cycle. I mean, every element has a cycle, mm -hmm. and those are natural, you know, cyclical motions, whereas humans get involved and we take a huge chunk out of that. Um, mm -hmm. For instance, nitrogen. Uh, farmers need mm -hmm. nitrogen. You yeah. know, plant, we know that plants are grown by nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. You look on any fertilizer bag, you're going to see NPK. Yep. or uh, a number, a hyphen, a number, a hyphen, and another number, mm -hmm. which indicate the uh, relative concentrations of those fertilizers. Yeah. Well, those are the three main elements, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. Anyway, nitrogen goes on a field. Um, farmers put that nitrogen on the field to grow plants. Mm -hmm. However, we've decided that we want to get the maximized yields out of these fields, and so we um, do things like tiling the fields, uh, minimize buffers you know tr we're trying rightly so we're trying to feed as many people get as much production out of the area as possible uh -huh. mm -hmm. however we don't consider that um, the nitrogen moving through the soil needs to sit there and in some cases you know through the winter or for years until a, a plant is able to reach out and grab it and move it into its its tissue uh -huh. uh, the problem with it with tiling that we're seeing is that uh, are you familiar with a percolator a coffee machine percolator. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All it's right, like so a... you put the grounds in the top of the percolator and the water's in the bottom. Mm -hmm. And now as the thing bubbles through, as the water moves through the coffee grounds, it picks up some of that coffee 
mm-hmm. and it turns it in, you know, the, the percolator into coffee. Yeah. Well, that same sort of thing is happening in the fields. And as the water moves through from these high water or, you know, high rain events, it settles into the tile and it's carrying with it the most water soluble form of nitrogen, which is nitrate. Uh-huh. And now we're mm-hmm. running that nitrate right to our the lowest area, either a ditch or a stream, or in some cases lakes. And those are moving, you know, it's compounding. Those small mm-hmm. streams go to a river, the river goes to a much bigger river, and eventually it ends up in the Gulf of Mexico. Yeah, mm-hmm. in the nitrate dead zone. In the nitrate dead zone. Uh-huh. Well, so we've got all this nitrate that's free flowing in the environment around us. This is free for us to use, you know, we're leaving, essentially money on the table in in some of these cases. Um, The University of Wisconsin uh, in their, uh, in one of their newsletters had a study that showed that fields that use tiling actually ran off nitrate four times faster than just fields that had no tiling whatsoever. And that included, they measured, you know, the runoff from the surface as well. But we're seeing four times that nitrate going right into our bodies of water, which are causing all these issues with the algae and and pollution. I'd be curious to see if they could quantify how much wasted chemicals are in certain rivers, you know, like how many... How many gallons of uh, uh, nitrates? How many gallons of phosphorus are we looking at? How much food could we potentially grow with those? Well, really what we're looking at is more like a parts per million. So it's not that we're able to look at the water and go in 2,000 gallons, we've got 50 pounds of nitrate. We're looking at the water and we're going for every million molecules, we've got 90 parts per million Uh of nitrate. Um, Now, from an aquaponics standpoint, what I can do is I can grow lettuce in about 20 to 40 parts per million okay. or I can grow a much heavy feeder like a pepper or a tomato in the 60 80 90 parts per million range okay what we're seeing according to the Blue Earth County soil and water conservation is in some of these ditches we're seeing 90 to 100 parts per million of nitrate just free flowing through these ditches. Wow. So we have the potential to grow nearly any plant, including heavy nitrogen feeders, you know, like tomatoes. So what do we do? We, we could tap into all these ditches that run through the country that just feed right from tiling. Uh-huh. Or we could look at bodies of water that are turning really green, you know, our, our local lakes that are bright green in the summertime. That's all in excess of nitrogen, yeah. phosphorus, uh, to a lesser degree, probably some ammonia in there as well. But all available nutrients for, for plants to gladly take up. Interesting stuff. Hmm. So it sounds like aquaponics could definitely be a, a part of the solution. The question I have for you, though, is how does that play into the situation we're facing with um, like the algal blooms? You know, when people look at algal blooms, they talk a lot about like the dissolved oxygen issue. And when there's too much biomass in the water, it creates an imbalance in oxygen from night to day. It has something to do with plant respiration. So would exactly, aquaponics yeah. add to that or would it not because they're actually not really in the water? They go. They're terrestrial plants, so they're doing their normal thing. They're not contributing to the oxygenation of the water in any way. Oh, wow. Um, so as long as we can, and that's a big thing with aquaponics, the, the, the primary mechanism here is an aerobic mechanism, you know, so uh, oxygen. The more oxygen we can get in there, the better. Um, but a th- something like a river or a stream that's got the moving water already is going to be pretty heavily oxygen, you know, oxygenated. Okay. I'm curious because it sounds like aquaponics are such a, an awesome solution for getting rid of potentially some of these chemicals that we have in excess amounts in our water. But I've also heard that um, too much biomass can cause uh, deficiencies in oxygen in the water, which makes it hard for animal life aquatic life to live okay so to visit that the too much biomass portion is simply a response a natural response by the plants in the water either the single cell um, uh, phytoplankton type plants or actually duckweed things that float on the surface milfoil things like that Um, but what it is is just a natural response to the level of nutrients that are there and 
as such when there's a ton of biomass producing oxygen in the daytime. As soon as we switch over to nighttime and all of those cells go to breathe and let out their respiration, we switch over to carbon dioxide and they remove the oxygen from the water. So, mm. I mean, again, aquaponics would remedy this by removing the nutrients and thereby eliminating the available nutrients for those algaes to grow. Yeah, so less algae is going to grow if there's less nutrients for them to grow on. Exactly. I mean, the, the, the yeah. main thing here, the main uh, word is nutrient mitigation. Like, these, these nutrients aren't, this isn't a problem per se. This is a misdirection or a redirection of, of available nutrients. Mm -hmm. So instead of having these, the, nutrient, the nitrates and the phosphates in the land growing vegetables like, like we want, um, we they found their ways in into our waterways and we don't want them there so we simply switch our growing methods or switch our methodology how we process water as a whole and we can start to eliminate those nitrates and phosphates and have a viable marketable product whether that's a food product or a um, mm -hmm. cotton hemp hemp would be great yeah mm. especially if our argument for for this excess agriculture is that we have to feed the growing population of the world it's a wonder why we're not already growing food with the with the chemicals at hand right yeah it's available it's floating by us and we're not wow. doing anything yeah. with it so you know that's that's another focus of aquological is that we want people to think out of the box like you have the potential if you're a homeowner if you're a, a property owner and you're near a body of water like there's a limitless amount of solutions essentially it basically involves we we take that water whatever our source water is whatever its nitrate and phosphate content is mm -hmm. and we run that through any number of systems um, simple systems uh, um, like I had talked before about irrigating your lawn with, uh, if you live on a lake, it, the lakes in the area, uh, the DNR has opened up. You can irrigate your, your lawn with lake water. So now if you're the kind of person that e irrigates your lawn with lake water, as long as you don't plant, or excuse me, as long as you don't utilize fertilizers and pesticides and change your oil in your yard and things of that mm -hmm. nature, as long as you're maintaining a good um, ecology for that land, the water that you're irrigating with is being filtered and cleaned by your grass in your yard and then returned to the water table of that lake or that area um, slightly cleaner. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. I mean, it's not a huge jump forward, but it's something the average person can really start to do to mm -hmm. if they're concerned about water quality. Yeah, that'd be s yeah. as simple as putting in a pump of some sort and... A, uh, yeah, yeah, a tiny pump. Uh, there's even solar pumps, so there would be no additional cost as far as energy use and things like that. Yeah. And it's remarkable how little uh, water volume is required. So 50 to even 250 gallons per hour is a pretty reasonable volume of water to be processing through a small aquaponics system. Okay, hmm. cool. But compound that by 250 an hour, 24 hours a day, you know. 30 days a month I mean it re it really adds up and now yeah. if we can get you and your neighbor and your next door neighbor all with these systems these nutrient mitigation systems um, we can really start making a grassroots effort to help clean the lakes around here That'd and cool. minimal cost minimal cost too have you ever talked with the uh, crystal water projects guys I have I've talked with quite a few of the local like lake um, associations and things and there's a lot of interest and there's a lot of questions and there's a lot of, um, because it's kind of not the status quo, the, there's some hesitation, I think, for people to kind of just jump into this, something like this, you know? Yeah. But we need some people to start. And um, uh, once again, with, uh, with what I do, I want to be a resource for people to provide my 30 years of, you know, growing plants and fish and aquariums and all of that and try to integrate that into clean water and food production. Awesome. Well, we appreciate your work. Thank you. Do you guys know, like, w I'm just curious, what, what is, like, the city, or any city, but even, like, the city of Mankato doing about stuff like this? Like, why why isn't nutrient mitigation Almost something? Almost nothing. It's, w yeah, like, I mean, I'm just curious about that. Why isn't that something that's being, uh, you know, almost... 
it's it's forced it's upon it, people you know that's a really good question dave it's and it's debatable as to the stance they're taking on one end you can look at them and see that you know through our wastewater program we've you know won all sorts of awards for being like uh you know raising the bar mm-hmm. on taking ownership over uh the water that's going through the storm drains and through our wastewater facility and being put into mm-hmm. the river there are state mandates that require us to get that water that we're putting back into the river down to uh certain levels of some of these contaminants mm-hmm, and we're actually sure. doing such a good job that we're selling credits to smaller towns who mm-hmm. don't have the infrastructure and wastewater facilities to uh, counteract the, the the high levels of some of these contaminants that they're seeing. So mm-hmm. as a city on one end, you could say, oh, wow, well, we're doing an awesome job. Yeah. But then on the other end, it's like, okay, we're not really so much taking a stance in the regional aspect of mm-hmm. things. We're saying, okay, we're going to we're gonna do awesome as a city because we're the city and that's what we can do. We can't be accountable for everything that happens outside. Right. But at the same time, I feel like as a city, as the hub of Southern Minnesota, we do have to have some level of accountability. And to hear all the time people talking about uh, right. excess chemicals from agriculture actually getting into the storm drains that are managed uh, by the city and city um, workers and politicians being upset that we're having to spend so much money uh, reducing the chemicals that are coming into our city storm drains from agriculture because when it's outside of the city we don't really have to deal with it if it's in the river unless we're drawing it to drink it you know it doesn't really uh, mm-hmm. affect us one way or the other in their eyes yeah but that's part of it too I mean yeah we're doing a fantastic job with the water that we use that is our wastewater right but there is no such thing as wastewater mm. someone else gets that wastewater mm-hmm. it becomes their source water Right. Okay, but also we need to look at is just <laughs> the awesome. honestly the way that we have integrated water into our lives. We we've, we've pushed it underground. There's this great website. You can go on, you can Google Minnesota aerial photographs. Um it's the University of Minnesota has compiled all of these aerial photographs that go back to like the 20s, the 1920s. Uh-huh. And it is it's really well, A really interesting and cool and neat, but B heartbreaking. I mean, you can look Why at these that? huge areas of, uh, well, uh, prior to like the 40s, 50s, 60s, farmers were farming. You can look at, you can look on the map and you'll see uh, five acres of this, 10 acres of that, 20 acres of this, 50 acres of that. And it was these small managed plots. The uh-huh. stream, they, they were laid in and amongst the streams and the potholes and, and all of the topography of these farm fields. Well, we've slowly mowed over this stream and leveled off that pothole and all of that. So the natural ways for denitrification to occur and for the nitrate yeah. to be removed from the water um, are basically gone. We've removed all of that, all of the buffers, all of the small little tributary streams. And either it's gone underground or it's simply been filled in and removed. It's almost the opposite of biomimicry. It is. It is. Yeah. It's basically, you know, the, what is it, a John Mayer song, paved paradise, put up the parking lot kind <laughs> yeah. of thing. You know, uh-huh. I mean, instead of having these beautiful natural areas and utilizing the land, working with that topography, we're just like, we'll make it flat. It's easier to grow, you know, or or. We fill it in and we don't have to deal with the soggy roots in our plants. And it all happened so fast. You know, we didn't have a thousand years to monitor its success and its, uh, uh, you know, ineffectiveness. Um, We just did it because we assumed that it was going to be the best thing for the economic value of our land and agriculture. Well, it seems logical, you know, hey, I got a puddle. I don't want a puddle get rid of the puddle you know mm-hmm. i mean it's just it it's the way humans behave you know we see a problem we resolve the problem in the most expedient manner we don't necessarily mm-hmm. think in fact frequently we rarely think of the long-term ramifications of our actions mm-hmm. yeah. and now we're starting to see i mean especially with the continued tiling of all the agriculture it's uh, accelerating the the problem yeah and it's a systematic mm-hmm. issue because if it was just one farmer doing this right we wouldn't even be talking about it it's just because every single farmer out there is doing the same thing to get to the Mm -hmm. same goal that well and there's companies out there that are going door to door you know to farmers saying 
you've got to have our tile system. We've got the best one. Let me put it in. I tell you what, we'll finance it for you. We'll let you pay it out over 10 years, this and that. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't in any way want to come down on the farmers. This is all of us. You know, we, we, we're yeah. so far past blaming someone for any of the water quality issues. We need to forget about blame and start looking at remedy. Yeah. yeah. Because things are going bad and they're going bad quick. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, let me just give you an example. Uh, sure. When I, I'm, I'm 41 now. So okay. when I was about 12, 13, 14, I used to snorkel in almost every lake here in the local area, Washington, Madison, Hineker Pond. Mm -hmm. It was nearly crystal clear, even July, early August, you know, you'd start to get some algae and stuff, but it was mostly seaweed, you know, mostly plants growing. Yeah. Now you can't even put your hand six inches under the water come August and see your hand. The water mm-hmm. is so green. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's all the nutrients that are available. So if in the last less than 30 years, we've gone from clear, beautiful swimming lakes to 42% of the lakes in Minnesota don't meet the safe water requirements of the DNR, uh-huh. like where mm-hmm. are we going to be in another 30 years? Yeah. Oh, boy. Oh, that's, right? Yeah. I mean, it. I, I don't, I hate being doom and gloom, but mm-hmm. we we don't realize the the depth of this problem. Yeah, it's scary yeah. to think about. It's time for us to start taking it seriously. Yeah, and and that's again my goal is to focus on hey, you live near a lake, you've got an extra 100 bucks in your pocket and you want to invest in something that's going to help. Well, we can we can try to find a solution that's going to work for you. Yes. And maybe you set up a little a uh, little marigold bed on your shoreline. You know, and then you get the benefit of some marigolds and whatever um, animals or, or insects mm-hmm. come to that. And yeah. then you also know that you're helping to reduce some of the nutrients. Mm-hmm. And if we get 100 people, 1,000, 100,000 to do something like that, well, you know, we're, we're making some steps. Yeah, in the right direction. So in addition to aquaponics, Seth, could you tell us a little more about some of the other kind of projects you work on and how people could implement those? Well, it it really comes down to just about anything with ecology. So my primary focus is water, and I got started with aquariums, and so that's kind of always been kind of my love. If I can get someone to have a successful aquarium, on, on, on two different levels I'm winning. A, they're involved and, and intimate with the water cycle and, and how water ecology, water chemistry works. They start to carry that over into their own life. But B, a successful aquatic ecosystem in someone's home is also going to uh, provide a habitat, provide a healthy quality place for these fish and things that we're already taking as decorative and ornamental. Um, maybe I can prevent... Um, we've all seen that movie Nemo where the little girl shakes the little bag of fish and kills the fish. You know, mm-hmm. if I can prevent one or 20 or 50 of those, then, yeah. you know, I'm doing something. Yeah, yeah. And it's like I said, yeah, I can either sit around and, and be really concerned about the state of our environment, or I can just make these tiny little chips away at, at the overall problem. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, um, projects. So I do freshwater aquariums, um, focusing on, mostly the environment the ecology so uh there's there's a popular aquarium show that's on like the discovery channel and they build these elaborate super fancy aquariums but they're filled with like gumballs or Mm. uh star wars or baseball and what those are is those are environments for the people that are having the aquariums, those aren't environments for the inhabitants, Uh Mm -hmm. you know? So I focus on, okay, you want to keep this particular species of fish. It comes from this particular environment in the world. The water ecology in that place is X, Y, or Z. Mm -hmm. And here's how we recreate that as closely as possible. So the fish are happy, the inhabitants are happy, and they're thriving, and then the people get to see that, and they really enjoy it. Yeah, cool. You know, then mm-hmm. the cool part about all of this is an aquarium, freshwater, saltwater, hard water, you know, soft water, all of that water ecology is universal. So a saltwater aquarium, give or take, has nearly the exact same chemistry as a freshwater aquarium. The hmm. nitrification cycle is identical in the two. Interesting. Hmm. 
yeah. So once a person learns about water, uh, ecology, and, and chemistry, that carries through from when they're brushing their teeth in the morning to when they're working on their coral reef tank in uh-huh. their basement in the evening or whatever. Mm-hmm. Never thought about it like that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what are green walls, green roofs, and rain gardens? Or at least just one of those. I don't know what any of those are. I can imagine mm-hmm. what a green roof is. What's what's a green wall? Let's start with that one. Well, these. I mean, it, so a green wall, plants on a wall. Green roof, plants on a roof. Um, but what these are is, again, they can be nutrient mitigation systems. Uh, so if I've got, say, uh, say I have a building, and immediately behind the building is an old, nasty, scummy ditch, uh-huh. well, I could potentially take some of that water irrigate my green wall or my green roof cleaning the water and returning it back to this uh, this water source secondarily we can use we can create small bodies of water if i'm having a problem with runoff in my business or my home i'll make a small pond either a pond that's like a, a rain garden where when it fills up with drainage and then slowly leaches back into the ground or a dedicated pond that we can actually use as a decorative element and draw um, to to grow plants, to uh, irrigate our lawn, to grow a garden. The, the point is that these nutrients are just floating around, and if we can trap them in some way and use them and then send clean water on to the next person, well, then we've done our part as a community. Yeah. Hmm. And I think something you were maybe planning to elaborate on earlier but didn't get a chance to, when we were talking about the the city, you know, how, how could the city adjust its approach? You know, currently we're, like you said, sending it all underground through our stormwater system. You know, is there any way cities have been finding creative ways to not just send it to the sewer? And For me, one of my favorite models is Vancouver. So uh, the, the city proper in Vancouver is fascinating. There's huge, huge vertical buildings. You know, it's just a traditional uh high population city center it's extremely dense uh-huh. um, but as you're walking along beneath the bottom of all of these buildings there's all this very fascinating uh, somebody's somebody's jamming out on a banjo next door so i guess <laughs> i guess we get a good old bit of music <laughs> hey, we'll go talk. Ba- banjo music this is uh, perfect hey uh, there you go um, i totally got lost it fits really good no uh, cities uh <laughs> okay, vancouver, so vancouver what so, they got going on yep so in the densest portion of the city um, where rainfall would had basically has nowhere to go, mm-hmm. they've designed all of these little water uh, catchment systems, and it appears as though they're designed to work both with minimal amount of flow and then in high-volume situations. Mm-hmm. So the city of Vancouver is taking this water and kind of channeling it through the city both for the enjoyment of the citizens because, hey, water's fun, and we all like the sound that water makes as it trickles over the, the little rocks and yeah, things yeah. in our environment. Mm-hmm. But also, so suddenly uh, half the city isn't covered in water when five inches of rain falls and, and we've got all these non-pervious surfaces. Yeah. So there's there, there's literally like I keep saying there's countless ways to utilize this. We could um, run small channels through the city. Um, uh, Whistler, Whistler, British Columbia has this large pool that essentially all the snow melts into on kind of the high point in in Whistler. Okay. And then right by the where they had the Olympics and kind of the main pedestrian area, there's a really wide kind of a, a channel thing, a man-made channel. And so mm-hmm. they've taken the what we would do in, in Mankato and in this area is we would consider that wastewater or runoff water, mm-hmm. and we would build a big storm culvert, and we would send that underground and run it to the river or wherever. Well, what they've done is they've embraced it, and they've created this ecological area with beautiful riparian areas on each side and plants growing, and mm-hmm. you can sit there and have your lunch or whatever. And this is integrated right into a high pedestrian area, so it's it's not as though this would be um, impossible. I mean, it'd be something that's quite easy, I would think. Do you think Mankato's ready for something like that? Absolutely. I think, man. you know what, I'm born and raised in Mankato. I love Mankato. I've traveled the world pretty extensively, and I come mm-hmm. back here all the time. I mean, we've got everything. And Same. we need to be the leader. <laughs> you know, we, we have a super strong community, 
We have brilliant people, you know, with all the education we have in the area. And we have this young population that's starting to think outside the box. People like yourself, Paul, mm -hmm. that are just trying to correct some of the, the issues that we've kind of seen arising. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, let's fill the I, I honestly have a dream of seeing like the entire Mankato area. Um, streams and and water runoff and some of that utilized in different ponds and you know because mm -hmm. it's a bigger issue i mean water is the source of life and what we're seeing with all of the all the doom and gloom news that's coming out these days 60 percent of our insect biomass has been has, has disappeared mm -hmm. in the last 20 years wow so yeah. whatever we can do, especially with water, to recreate these areas where plants and insects can recreate the life that they've known for millennia, we got to do it, man. We got to mm -hmm. we got to bring our ecology back into our urban centers. I'm really glad you said that because I feel like it's easy to look past some of the water quality issues we're facing because we get to as humans filter our water you know through a municipal system but you know deer deer don't have that same opportunity to you know get their water out of a, a brita filter you know right. so well like, and that's not even deer i mean you'd mentioned the crystal waters project earlier and the reason that started was because crystal lake in lake crystal mm -hmm. had blue green algae that uh, some animals were dying from and this was right in there in the town you know yeah. so it wasn't just deer it's it wasn't wild animals this is affecting even dogs and and squirrels and you know the animals that are ubiquitous in a city center mm -hmm. yeah yeah hmm. any uh current projects that you want to talk about anything exciting going on right now seth I don't have any real big projects at the moment. This is kind of my slow time of year, but I'm always working on proof of concept. Uh, I've been growing a lot of house plants lately uh -huh. uh, in aquaponics, just so I could transfer that knowledge into, uh, so one of the problems, again, with nitrification and home aquariums is the natural buildup of nitrate. It happens even in your home aquarium. And the, the byproduct of that in a home aquarium or in a pond is algae. So if someone's having a real difficult time with algae, we can throw this small add-on device, uh, something made out of uh, PVC piping, or we can get really fancy with other additional aquariums or grow beds or build some custom thing. Uh -huh. um, but we can do nutrient mitigation on a small aquarium. You can grow herbs, uh, basil on your windowsill from your aquarium in your corner of your house. Well, that's cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, or simply just grow anything. You know, indoor air quality is another big concern, and there's a multiple... Uh, species of plants that will help with indoor air quality so again hmm. you know if we can cr have these aquaponic systems inside air quality is better you know your your overall health is better you mm -hmm. people are less stressed uh, there's tons and tons of studies out there about just the effect nature has on human beings mm -hmm. um, and anyone that wants to Google it can find literally yeah. uh, study after study. So we can integrate that into our lives, clean water, uh, healthy fish, healthy plants. I mean, it's just, there's no, I can't find any downside to any of this. Mm -hmm. So if, if any, if you or any of your listeners has some ideas about what I'm missing here, I'd love oh. to hear it because mm -hmm. I've, I, it, it almost seems too good to be true sometimes. Yeah, and it sounds like you've got a pretty well well rounded approach to it. You see all the different ways, you know, uh, water touches us. It's not just one way or the other. There's a lot of different ways, and you're kind of trying to show people like all the all the different opportunities there are to get one step closer to right, right. I mean, that, symbiosis. There's, there's so many ways because we've we've placed uh, we put baby in the corner. You know, we put mm -hmm. put water in the corner. We just use it because it's there and because we can but we don't respect the value of water mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. i until we're out in the woods for two days woods. <laughs> but no i mean that's something that really needs to be people really need to make be aware of that water is eventually the nitrate problem is going to exceed what we can do 
if we end up at 40, 50, 90 parts per million of nitrate in the city well, that's going to be expensive to remedy. Oh, yeah. We're going to need huge levels of filtration. Then what do you do with that tainted filtration media? I mean, if we can nip this in the bud now or at least get some organic methods to deal with this, mm -hmm. we're, we're, it'll pay dividends long term, uh, you know, on an order of magnitude, you know, tens, hundreds. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I know uh, wastewater was considering, they've already implemented some sort of bioreactor, but they were looking at this one add-on device, but it was like $30 million that would get all the, I think, nitrates and phosphates out of our water potentially. I, don't quote me on that, but right. something to that effect. But, but the expense involved in something like that. Now yeah. let's take $30 million and let's dig a, a nice long ditch that just winds back and forth. And let's fill <laughs> that ditch with plants because yeah. I guarantee we'll be able to do a lot more with, yeah, yeah. with that. That's going to regrow every year. The maintenance is almost minimal on something like that. And we don't end up with a whole bunch of filtration media that's yeah. saturated with phosphorus and nitrate. Because yeah. then what do you do? You take some media and now that's, you know. Going somewhere. Yeah. Put it in a landfill. What? Mm -hmm. I think the thing that's really important for me to mention here is so once um, plants bind these nutrients, uh -huh. their biomass, if you want to take it a step further, needs to be harvested. So the nitrate is floating in the water. It gets sucked up the root of the plant. It ends up in the leaf. It's bound by the leaf. Okay, if we let nature continue to take its course in that plant to decompose in the fall, those nutrients will likely end up back in that body of water. Uh. However, if we chop those all down and throw them on our compost pile, we get double duty because we get nice... Uh, rich compost from that nitrogen and again now those the nutrients aren't bioavailable to return to our our water source yeah yeah, mm -hmm. cool stuff <clears throat> so seth how can our audience help you is there anything that you need help with i need help with projects i need help with ideas i think that there's a limitless amount of options here essentially if you've got a plant you want to grow if you've got a source of water, let's come up with a project. Let's come up with an idea. Like I said in the beginning, my primary focus isn't to get rich. I'm certainly not going to get rich from, from building ponds and aquariums. Mm -hmm. My primary focus is to fix the world that we've, uh, we've gotten off the rails here. Mm -hmm. And we need to get this train back on the tracks because yeah. what's coming down from the future is going to catch a lot of people um, by surprise. Because this is one of those things that one of these days, all of a sudden, we're going to hit this wall. We're going we're gonna to meet this tipping point, and we're not going to be prepared to handle it. And to correct the problem once it's a much bigger problem or bigger issue is going to require tremendous resources. So let's get in now. Let's create the world that we mm -hmm. want to create, you know, the kind of, kind of city center that's dripping with uh, fruits and vegetables and uh, green walls and green roofs and we've monitored uh, our wastewater that's coming off of the roofs and we've cleaned all of that I mean let's really make that utopian Mankato that I, I know that we can make and that starts with literally everyone that's willing to listen if I mean if you've made it this far and you've you care about this sort of thing there is definitely something you can do and if if that's a start of a, a tiny rain garden that feeds some lettuce in your backyard then let's do that and I'm here to answer any questions any hypotheticals um, I'll contact anyone I'll speak with any group any uh, church group school group any anyone that's willing to listen to my ideas and and that's just all that all most of this is is um, kind of a, a, a concept here's the concept now what can we do with it you know, I'm mm -hmm. sure there's people out, out there that are way smarter than I am that can le let, and this can be scale. I, I should say that too. So we can go from a tiny little five gallon aquarium on your counter mm -hmm. up to a 40,000 gallon or 40,000 square foot uh, warehouse where we're cleaning water <laughs> like it's our job. Sky's the know? limit, man, Cato. Mm -hmm. yeah. You heard the man. Yeah. And <laughs> I mean, that what would that do can you imagine so, so can you imagine if we invested in a water treatment facility that tapped into the nitrate and phosphates that are flowing through our rivers as a free source and then we could grow let um in 32 square feet on a raft four by eight 
I can grow 50 heads of lettuce every six weeks. Imagine what I could do with 40,000 square feet mm. and unlimited 90 parts per million of nitrate. We're dang near talking feeding Mankato. You could feed mm. the town. We, and even if, it, even if we decide that, hey, this isn't suitable for human consumption, which I don't know why it wouldn't be, mm -hmm. um, what about animal feed? What about, uh, what about simply harvesting mm. the biomass to compost? I know a lot of cities are doing that where you th give them their, your leaves, they'll compost it, give it back to you if you decide you want some nice black composted soil. Yeah. So let's mm -hmm. take, I mean, the, the, these uh, systems are in place. We just need to utilize them a little bit better and get the full use out of it. Yeah, so Seth, if somebody wanted help with uh, an aquaponics idea they had, an aquarium, a pond, uh, a green wall, a green roof, how could they get a hold of you? Uh, well, you can always reach me at Seth at AqualogicalResources.com. You can check out my website, uh, I, AqualogicalResources.com. I also picked up Aqualogical.org. Mm -hmm. Shortens it down a little bit. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and the org is just because I, I am not a capitalistic entity that's out to get as much money as I can. Mm -hmm. I'm primarily focused on how can I help you integrate water into your life mm -hmm. so yeah ca call me send me a text email uh, look at Facebook I have a Facebook page mm -hmm. you can find me cool That's glad I found you I am too I am too you know what I, I and I want to take the opportunity to really thank you because uh, we need more leadership like yourself making awareness for everyone on a day-to-day -day level. And I think that there's so many opportunities we have here. Um, hopefully someone hearing this can come up with something crazy mm -hmm. that we can really make some strides forward. Yeah. Or maybe some people in a position of power hear this and yeah. say, you know, that's there's the some idea. things we can integrate. Yeah. yeah. Yep, that's the idea. Cool. So, well, I want to thank you for coming on today, Seth. Yeah, it's my a pleasure, pleasure having you. Yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, let's also thank uh, KMSU again. Um, not, not just for the banjo background music, but for <laughs> letting us uh, come in here and do this. So. Yeah, thank you. Awesome. All right. All right. Bye. Bye. Water is the foundation of life itself, and what we have here is a major water problem. Let's harness the pride that we have for our 10,000 lakes and reclaim what we are quickly losing. Everyone is downstream from somebody.